I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Uh, my name is Dale Hawthorne. This is my channel. And this is going to be a message um, to you. It's something which I believe that uh, many, many Christians in our age have never heard a message on this passage. And it really does uh, make a real difference in your life to know what the Great Commission is all about. As we go into the Word, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us your word, that Jesus has spoken to us, and his words have been preserved for us. He has given us this mission, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will make these words uh, come alive in our hearts, and that they'll become a part of our life, that we will live out what Jesus has to say to us and to our world, and to follow his word as faithfully as he has lived for us on this, on this earth. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us and strengthen us in the path of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, many, many years ago, uh, the great missionary uh, Hudson Taylor, the man who founded the China, China Inland Mission, who went to uh, China and on the basis of faith, trusted God for his provision, and who also came back and spoke in the United States and England many times of the need of the world. He said once that the sun never sets on the world one half of it is always in the light of day. Likewise, God never intended part of his world to lay permanently out of reach of the light of his truth. God has given us this assignment. This message is entitled Assignment Earth. He's given us this assignment and the con concern of God is for the entire world. We see this as revealed in the person and mission of his son, Jesus Christ. His son came to our world and concern is motivated by a love which reaches every person, matter who or she may be, the love of God for this world, for God so loved the world. And it's shown by the death of uh, Christ on the cross for the sins of the world, so that the salvation may be made available for all who receive it by faith. It's shown in the resurrection and ascension of the uh, Lord to the, be the ultimate authority in the universe. It's shown in the constant repetition of the assignment that he has given his church, his people, every believer who has been saved by faith in the Son of God, to reach the world with the message that the message which has brought them salvation is to be shared with others who need to know that salvation. And this is the assignment which was given a number of times during the 40 days of his teaching ministry to the apostles after the resurrection, the post resurrection ministry before his ascension then into heaven. You'll find this uh, talked about in the Luke 24, um, Acts 1, Matthew 28, and uh, um, John 20, uh, 20 and 21. So this will be his post-resurrection ministry. These words which are given by the same Jesus who was crucified and died on the cross, who's risen again, his post-resurrection ministry. And he gives this assignment to the church based upon all that he has already done. He has paid the price for our salvation. He has risen again. He is standing there before them with the wounds in his hands and his side to show that he has paid the price for their salvation. So he gives us this assignment and it's backed by his universal authority and constant presence for the assistance of those who go out and who follow his will. And through the apostles, this church come this uh, assignment comes to the church, to each one who has been saved by faith in Jesus Christ to reach all the people of this earth with his gospel. And this command is uh, in the form we're looking at it right now called the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all the world from all the nations of this world. This assignment is a great unfinished task of the Church of Jesus Christ. The task that always requires renewed attention and constant prayer. He's given us this task. This is his assignment. It's necessary for us to learn the direction of the Lord to fulfill his command and receive from him all that's necessary to fulfill that task. He's given it to us. If we're looking for a purpose in life, looking for a purpose in the church, let's start right here. His last command should be our first concern in the church. That's a slogan of the denomination I'm with, the Christian and Missionary Alliance. But that really should be a first concern of every believer in Christ. To learn the direction of the Lord, what he wants here, to fulfill this command, to receive from him all that's necessary to fulfill the task. This task is then impossible to us 
if we're up to us alone. But it's not to him. It's not impossible to him. And it's not impossible to him as he works through us, as we respond to his command through faith and obedience. It isn't a command that he's given us and just left us there to do it on our own strength, on our own power, by ourselves. It isn't a do-it-yourself project for the church. It's a do-it-with-him project. So let's take a look at what the apostle had to say. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He's surely with us to do this. So, first thing, the risen Lord has commanded his followers to make disciples everywhere in the world. All the people of the world are the, to be those who are to receive the gospel. Pro, they're all prospects for becoming disciples of Jesus Christ, our mission field. The mission field which he's given us is everywhere in this world and the prospects for the gospel are everyone. And the base of this command is the complete and universal authority of Jesus Christ. The risen Lord has authority in his hands, all authority in his hands, to claim disciples from everywhere in this world. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's claiming it for himself over all the earth. It's a startling statement. Yet it's backed by the amazing fact of that crucifixion and that resurrection. And again, this is the person who nail prints are still visible in his hands as he made this statement. The place where the spear went into his side, on his feet. The marks of the crucifixion are upon him, but he's risen again and speaking to them. The same Jesus who was crucified, who lived and ministered among them. And he's claiming now before them to have all authority in heaven and on earth, the authority of God himself. And this claim to have all authority implies that he has the right to claim the submission of each individual in this world to himself. He is the Lord he, of all, all authority in heaven and earth, and every knee, every must bow, every tongue must confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is the assurance that everywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ is valid upon this world. It's and it's right to call others to become disciples of Jesus Christ, even if they're adherents of other religions. Jesus made this command with full awareness that there were other religions in this world, that there were other religions beside the Jews, that, and he really wasn't really looking to find just another religion to compete with the others. He was claiming the authority of, for everywhere to, to make disciples, even people out from other religions. And the authority of Jesus is behind all evangelism, discipleship, and missions in the Church of Jesus Christ. Because everyone everywhere is one day going to have to answer to Jesus Christ, to stand before him. And what we will say will not be just simply throwing out our opinions, but we will have our lives, our words examined, and our opinions will not justify us one bit, but we must give our account to the Lord and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The fact that he is Lord of all authority, heaven and earth is beginning, center, and end of missions to reach the world with the message which he has given. So he's commanded to go, this going into the world with the message of the gospel, to make disciples. Making disciples requires those who are disciples to go to those who are not disciples to share the gospel so they might become disciples of Jesus Christ. He has just said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All the Gentiles, that can also be translated. And this means it's the responsibility of all those who are there. The twelve were there too, but there uh, could have been up to 500 there hearing us at this time. This may be the same incident which Paul was talking about in First uh, Corinthians chapter uh, 15, where 500 or so witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. This could be the same time, but we do know that there were many there who heard this. Jesus told us, and the apostles 
and the early church started from Jerusalem, where they were at that time. Uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, they evangelized Jerusalem and built a strong church there, and then sent out missionaries and others, and uh, churches uh, were started to uh, spring up in Galilee, and eventually in Samaria, and started going out into the world. The strong church in Jerusalem is really the church which started all of the churches. And he sent, he sent out missionaries from there to build strong and witnessing churches. And these churches would then send forth more missionaries, more to uh, people to set, spread, uh, spread the gospel, share the gospel until all have heard, until all have heard. We're not going to see the message ever uh, become irrelevant, obsolete, or the task completed until all have heard. We've been commanded to do this by the risen Lord himself. And making disciples means that they would call others, the people that they met, to the same faith in Jesus Christ, the same commitment to Jesus Christ that they had already come to. And we can see throughout the uh, gospel, throughout the New Testament, that it is a document, a, a hunting license, or a license for evangelizing the entire world, looking out upon the world with the eyes of Jesus, sharing his word, doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is, in fact, why the church does have leadership. The leadership of the church isn't there to make to feather their own nest, to gather their own money, to build up a big church where they can have everyone come in as one great big crowd. Uh, they're there to equip the body of Christ for ministry. Uh, I would encourage every uh, person in leadership to take uh, this great commission and go back to Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16, and see your place of ministry there to equip people for sharing the gospel around the world, not just in your neighborhood, not just to make your church bigger, but to uh, go out and reach the world, and equip people and let them go so that when they are called, when God does provide the openings, that you let them go. You don't try to keep them there to, to support your ministry to be, because it isn't your ministry. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. It's his ministry. It's his assignment. So let them go and make certain that they are receiving your ministry to equip them to follow Jesus to the uttermost in their lives. And this mandate that Jesus gives to go to others is a responsibility of the whole church, of every believer. Too often we have in our church what we could call, instead of the go strategy, in these verses it's the come strategy come here and listen come here be a part of our group come here listen to our pastor listen isn't he a great pastor doesn't he uh speak so well doesn't he give us so many wonderful feelings doesn't oh isn't our church wonderful isn't isn't our worship wonderful we get all these great feelings we go home on this high we're called to make disciples any of those things, if there were, if it's just coming, if it doesn't involve going and equipping and evangelizing, we've missed the direction which Jesus has given us, and we're falling into unbiblical ground, a place where God has not called us, where God is not directing us. And we, as we see what Jesus has here, this puts the task of evangelization of the world as part of the responsibility of every believer. We. Each individual can't go to every person in the world, each individual believer, but all of us together, we can reach this world. He's given us that assignment. And each believer is to be ready to be a witness to Jesus Christ where each and every believer is and around the world. There's a story of uh, uh, some uh, unit of Marines who were going through basic training, and one of them asked the drill instructor, Sir, what are our chances of going overseas? And the drill instructor said, there are three kinds of Marines. There are those who are overseas, the ones who have been overseas, and the ones who are going overseas. So I would say your chances are pretty darn good. So, and knowing as a drill instructor, that may, may be a watered down way of uh, putting it. So, um, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what's overseas, the world, what's beyond your group, the world, What's beyond your church, the world? What's beyond your city, your town, the world? What's beyond the state, 
the world is what Jesus has set upon you. And this is his assignment. Making disciples then means leading people to a complete commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord. Not some halfway, not just gathering a decision, letting them drift throughout their lives until the time that Jesus comes. And uh, it's not just recording a decision, a decision, putting down a, a slash mark somewhere that this person accepted Christ and going on. We fail to understand what it means, what Jesus is talking about, making disciples. Not just getting someone to pray a prayer, but making disciples. The full biblical implica implications of the sovereignty of Jesus Christ means each one of us is to become a responsible disciple to Jesus Christ. And verses 18, the rest of verse 18 and uh, ver um, rest of verse 19 is uh, often ignored by many people in the church that we just get someone to pray a prayer, mark down a decision, go on to the next person. And, but uh, that isn't what God really has for us. He tells us even more, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus talks about baptism and about obedience in his command to the church. Making disciples is the process of evangelistic reproduction. Jesus' meaning for the disciples would have been from the go and reproduce the process which they had been through with him. Repentance and faith in him first. It is in the Gospel of Matthew and it is in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus started out his ministry saying the kingdom of God is hand, repent and believe in the good news. They had come to that point. They had put in their faith in him and they had been through baptism. They had been through even the disciples baptized. You'll find this in the uh, Gospel of John. The early chapters there, how they baptized people. Jesus himself didn't do the do the baptism, but they themselves baptized also as a part of their responsibility to disciples. And they were commanded here to follow his word, and that's something throughout his ministry. You'll find that Jesus had a very profound and very common and very re repeated statement that he expected those who call, were expecting to receive his salvation to follow his word. And the goal of conversion isn't just to have a ticket away from hell and then live your life the way you own one. No, the ticket away from hell was was uh, would not be the was not what Jesus came just to give. Discipleship, a public commitment, a water baptism that was baptism by immersion in those days, and baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and the whole Trinity there. Notice right there, the whole Trinity is named. And then to continue as being a responsible follower of Jesus Christ, to grow in the spiritual maturity and obedience and experience a life of glorifying God and a life of his companionship. Because Jesus himself said, John 14, 21, that the person who has his commands and obeys him is the one who loves him. And if he's loved us so much to the death and the cross, we should certainly love him back in that way. And he says that uh, the Father will love him and I will come and make and... Uh, manifest myself to him, to know the life of Jesus living with you day by day, his presence, to know that he's there with you. That doesn't come if you're out there doing your own thing, ignoring his word, but it comes if you're there following him, respecting his word, following his word, believing what he has to say. That's where it comes. And the measure of, dis of evangelism, therefore, isn't the number of hash marks of people who've made decisions but disciples that are made. And disciples, faithful disciples, tend to reproduce faithful disciples. And throughout the um, past two centuries, there have been failures in areas of baptism, understanding what baptism is, and expecting people who have made the commitment to Christ to be baptized as Jesus expected, following the pattern of Acts that a person as they put their faith in Christ is expected to be baptized with them very quickly, very soon. And to make that commitment of turning your back on the world to uh, being uh, buried with him in baptism, to be raised up to a new life, then following Jesus in the life and teaching obedience to Jesus. So what's been the result? Shallow conversions 
People making professions without godly, consecrated believers, no life of witness, no missionary vision, no support of the worldwide ministering people, and uh, making hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites everywhere. People who claim to know Jesus Christ but are living contrary to his word. That's what happens when we don't teach that obedience to Jesus is part of being a disciple of Jesus. That was his expectation. This is not works right. This is the expectation of Jesus. It is salvation that saves us from sin to obedience to him. And we can look around our world and see so many uh, causes of unscriptural conduct, people living apart from the word in marriage, family, and in their work lives, and not witnessing, not being filled with the Spirit, not uh, showing righteousness. And uh, the command of Jesus means that his commands, his teaching, must be absolutely central in our lives. And this is what the expectation of Jesus himself, the risen Lord, his last assignment, his his uh, last commands to the work, church, as he was here on earth before the time of his ascension, had to do all with all of this. So we can't regard this nearly as lightly as we have. Uh, nearly, we can't continue. We need to make certain that G we're following Jesus and following his directions for reaching our world. So, there was once an author that uh, talked about um, evangelistic efforts in a, in a certain denomination. He said, we have too many non-resident members of day, today, people whose names were on the roster, people who feel they have made the one-time decision, walk to the altar and answer to that gospel, and yet are not aware of what they were doing and what is expected of them. They were um, praying a prayer, repeating a decision, and thinking that they're go going to heaven because of that. Although they really didn't understand what it meant to follow Jesus. And A.W. Tozer, um, the pastor in the Christian Mission Alliance who was considered a modern day prophet to our church in 1950, uh, 40s to 1960s, he said the first responsibility of the church is not to spread the gospel. The first responsibility of the church is to be spiritually worthy to spread the gospel. So this comes back to us, to Jesus' directions. Are we spiritually worthy? Are we following what Jesus had given, gave us here? Have we been baptized? Are we seeking to follow Jesus, to, his, to obey everything that he has commanded us? Jesus' directions for our mission challenges some of these present day notions of what evangelism is all about. It redirects our attention to first of all, not just expecting others to come inside our buildings, but to go to others with the gospel and training those who receive the gospel to be responsible disciples here after they have come to Christ, training them and what it means to live this new life. It also means living in a way which reaches others. And there's this old statement that talks about like produces like. You produce disciples in your church like the disciples who were sent out. So this shows the need for each person who claims to be following Jesus, to be sharing the gospel, to be a responsible disciple in his or her life, to be saved, baptized, following Christ daily, and then seeing ourselves as Christ's missionaries, whether we go outside our home country or not. His vision is and his burden for our world must penetrate our lives. And Jesus doesn't just leave us with command though. He gives us a promise, makes it certain that it will be fulfilled. The risen Lord is also present with his people wherever they are making disciples. He promised his presence, not so much simply as a comfort word we're lonely. This isn't just getting, if we're lonely, that he's going to be there. This is the context of the mission that he was given to his church to reach the world. And his promise finds its real fulfillment and true fulfillment when we're fulfilling our mission. When we're lonely and holding back from others, maybe not sharing gospel, uh, we may find him distant because uh, we're not following his word. But Jesus promises that he will be with us wherever we go until our mission is done. That's what this means. I am with you always to the end of the world. Wow. And that should be the basis of an indescribable confidence in our lives to go into the world with the gospel. Well, I'm all with you always to the very end of the age.
And this, again, is not just so much companionship, that we'll have Jesus walking alongside us, but his helping presence. He's underwriting the preaching of the gospel throughout this world. And we need to understand this is being um, fulfilled in the light of the Holy Spirit coming to the church at Pentecost. The Pentecost wasn't so much the birthday of the church that came from Augustine. And, and I really can't find that in the scriptures. But I do find the Holy Spirit coming upon the church to equip the church with divine presence and power for worldwide mission. And this is what Jesus expected, that they would wait for that. And this is what happened. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the church, and that meant the church was started to go out. The spirit of worldwide missions, the Holy Spirit, came upon the church to power the church for its worldwide ministry. And this impossible task that is ultimately the work of the Lord who does the impossible. This is the assurance that the task will be fulfilled, that the gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. And the Spirit of Jesus will be there to transform us in the likeness of Christ. The power of the Spirit of Christ will give us his strength to endure in faith and obedience beyond our own ability. It's dependent upon a way we are right now in ourselves. That self-confidence, he's calling us to confidence in him, in his presence. And his spirit will give us boldness to witness to him. And above all, to guide us to pray in his name for the provision of whatever our needs may be as we go about his mission. To make him known everywhere. Uh, many of us may have heard of David Livingston, who went to, to Africa. He went there as a missionary and he was scouting for missions. He wasn't simply some sort of explorer. He was specifically looking for places and ways to spread the gospel throughout the continent of Africa. And he came back and he spoke at the, at the Cambridge University in England. And there was awe when he walked out because one arm had been mangled by a lion. And as he hobbled out to, to speak, and when he spoke, he told them why and how he was able to do what he was able to do. To that point shall I tell you what sustained me amidst the toil the hardship and the loneliness of my exiled life it was the promise lo I am with you always even to the end of the world this promise of Jesus can keep us wherever we are whatever we're doing and Jesus Christ is in the midst of his people as they go out to fulfill his command to make disciples of all nations. He's there among us. His presence is the assurance that missions will not fail because the Lord who is behind missions will not fail. Our assignment is planet Earth. Our mission is to make disciples everywhere. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the message with which disciples make disciples. And that's the good news, that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. He rose in, from the dead pre to prepare a place in heaven for us. And eternal life, therefore, is a free gift. But once we receive eternal life as a free gift, the person who received it cannot remain the same. Whoever receives that gift of eternal life enters into living relationship with Jesus Christ as called discipleship to experience the power and the life of the Son of God living alongside. So, my question to you, if you're listening now, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And this is the question, is not is asking you pretty much whether you received eternal life by faith in Jesus. Have you received the eternal life, which he uh, suffered and died on the cross to provide for you, which he has risen again, which he gives out to the people with his hand, those who reach out to him with the empty hands of faith to receive that eternal life. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you have been saved by faith in him alone, if you have repented of your sins, trust in him, and he is your Lord and Savior now. Are you living as his disciple? And the first thing which Jesus expected here of his disciples was baptism, water baptism, the declaration of discipleship before the entire world. If you haven't been baptized, consider it. Look at his commands. Look at what he has to say for the, through the scriptures. Consider it and 
follow what he has to say here. It's a command of Jesus. Uh, go forward to a, a pastor. Uh, ask to be baptized if you haven't been baptized. And living in a, as a disciple means learning, believing, and following the word of Jesus Christ. What are you personally doing to follow the word of God in your life? What are you doing? Are you learning his word? Are you spending time in his word? Are you listening to the teaching of your word in, in the in your church? Do you go to a church which even preaches and teaches the word of God as the word of God, as the Bible? Are you living as a disciple? And if you are living as a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does that mean as far as you seeking to lead others to become disciples of Jesus? Do you know how to be an effective witness to Jesus Christ? Has anyone shown you how to witness in a scriptural manner? To be able to take the Bible, to be able to take the verses which talk about salvation, and be able to share the gospel in a way so that someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ can put his or her faith in Jesus as they're, as they're talking with you. And if you have been trained to witness, what are you doing to put it into practice in your daily life? We train and train and train in our Western church, but people don't seem to put it into practice very much. So what are we doing to put it into practice? Do you even review the scriptures which you were sh shared? Do you even go back and dust off the notebooks? What have you given there? Do you even review? Do you e Can you even look up the verses in the Bible which were shared for you on how to receive eternal life. Do you know where to even where to find them? And if you are our disciple of Jesus Christ, do you stand with your brothers and sisters in Christ in the mission to reach the world with the gospel? You have no other overarching mission. This is the ultimate mission of the Church of Jesus Christ. Whatever you may think that you've been called to do, whatever personal crusade you think you may have, this mission overrides that. If your mission isn't in line with what Jesus has to say here, you've taken something which isn't Jesus, applied it yourself, and you've said, I am Lord as far as this mission goes, and the mission which you gave me, Lord, that's not what I'm going to follow. Continuing as a disciple of Jesus Christ means this commitment to reach the world with the gospel, which comes from him. And it means that we do it in his way. And it means, first of all, prayer, being with, praying for this world, seeking to join hands with believers and praying for the needs that they have. Um, it's amazing how little missionary prayer goes on anymore, praying for the world, seeking for the provision of the world. And yet we see so many answers. It's been said that the um, recent breakthroughs with Muslims in the um, 1040 window, which we which has been talked about for probably about 40 years. That's come because we've been praying for that for 40 years. And it also includes not just prayer, but being willing to go oneself in whatever way the Lord might lead. Do you have barriers on where you're willing to go with the gospel? The Lord is going to be with you, provide for you in whatever place that he guides you. Let him be define your mission for you. Don't just take something and say this, especially not something from the culture, especially not something from, from a, a source which isn't even from the Bible. Be willing to go in your own life to whatever way the Lord might lead you. He might lead you to stay within your own culture, but um, support this mission of the world. Join hands, stand with your brothers and sisters in Christ to reach the world with the gospel. And if you're going to a church, if I'm speaking to leaders of a church here, is your church really a good Great Commission church? When was the last time you looked at this passage of scripture in regard to what you're doing in your church? What significance does the command of Christ, which he's given to the church as a whole, mean for you? Are you just leading in rituals? Are you just leading in songs? Is it just about keeping the, the machine going, the Sunday morning services going? Or will you take this command as a direction for your church as a whole? Will you approach, approach every ministry in your church from the standpoint of this command, supporting this command, the way that every fellowship is directed? Is this a part of the direction of your own church? 
my prayer for you as you're listening here is in the name of Jesus if you haven't received eternal life by faith in his name you would do so reach out say to him I repent of my sins I put my faith in you I will follow you and love you all that is my life I thank you for dying on the cross for me and I believe you are risen again and I confess to you now that you are my Lord and Savior my prayer for you also is if you have that made that commitment that you would understand what it means what Jesus expects of his disciples to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit to go forward and do that if you haven't done that and to obey everything he has commanded you because it comes on his authority my prayer would be that you would recognize his authority for your life to follow his word and continue with a disciple that you would do make making disciples a priority in your life and you would stand with your brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world not seeking to nitpick them but to seek to st stand with them in reaching the world with the gospel and if you are part of a church that you would make your church a great commission church a church which looks at these words this command of Jesus as the mission for this church not simply carrying up tradition carrying on the tradition which you've been carrying on for how however many dozens uh, decades hundreds of years thousands a couple thousand years maybe but you carry through with the mission which Jesus given you to make disciples Pray all these things for you now. Pray these things for you in Jesus' name. Amen.